Hello and welcome to Environmental Management 2A. My name is Warwick Allen and I will be taking you through Term 2 um, in terms of environmental management and uh, basic background around the topic. So on my schedule over here, I've got that we'll be starting with Theme 8, which is Water Resources and Pollution for this week. So for today, we'll start on Water Resources our next lecture will then be on water pollution and then from there we'll move on to climate change and um, food production and the environment and then so on and so forth. So for today let's have a look at uh, water resources. Let's have a look and see what you guys are getting yourselves into. So um, we'll start with uh, looking at Earth's water resources and then uh, discussing water in South Africa in general. And also just having a look at groundwater because that has its own domain and uh, we'll look at water supply methods uh, other water supply methods and uh, we'll then have a thing on using water sustainably and then from there move on to addressing water from a demand side approach okay so start off with let's have a look at um, earth's water resources water's gift is life Water is incredibly important to the health and well-being of individuals and the functioning of society. It supports all of our um, life on Earth and also helps maintain and sustain our economies. It is a vital form of natural capital and vast amounts of this resource are spent on food production, manufacturing, basic sanitation, this is in the sense that you know crops are needed to grow, you know cattle need to be um, washed, they need to drink water, manufacturing processes required, you know in terms of cleaning, in terms of um, water jets, uh, in terms of lubrication, um, and also just basic sanitation, you know in terms of washing your clothes and um, keeping yourself clean. So current thinking at the moment views water as an economic product in which it has a specific market value. Um, and although water is such an important resource in our lives through the socio-economic and environmental spheres, it is incredibly undervalued. And because it is so cheap, we mismanage it, we overuse it, waste it and openly pollute it. Access to water is not a question of quantity, but of quality, in which fresh drinking water is a global health issue, in which millions die due to waterborne diseases, as well as poor quality water, um, such as heavy metals present or um, microbes or sediment. Um, it is also an economic issue in which more than a third of the world's population is not able to afford pipe drinking water to their homes where they find themselves walking large distances on a daily basis just to get water to their homes. Fresh water is a global and national security issue in which um, water resources are beginning to dwindle as populations grow and this then causes tensions among areas in which there are shared water um, resources. It is also an environmental issue in which excessive exploitation of our water resources has dried up aquifers and reduced water tables in regions which has then caused the collapse of wetland and riparian ecosystems in many areas. We live in a planet of undrinkable water. Basically only 0.024% of all of Earth's water is actually available to us in the form of fresh liquid drinking water. This is in the form of lakes, rivers and streams, as well as um, underground deposits that would be accessible to us. The rest of it is 96.5% ocean or salt water. 1.7% of that is locked up in the poles and then the other 1.7% exists as deep, inaccessible, deep under, uh, underground uh, aquifers, excuse me. Ground and surface water. Much of Earth's freshwater reserves can be found underground, in which some uh, precipitation penetrates the ground surface 
and seeps through the soil until it reaches an impermeable rock layer or clay. Groundwater is often found at certain depths within the zone called the zone of saturation, where much of the underground spaces are completely occupied by water. The top of this groundwater is referred to as the water table, where deeper down we can encounter aquifers, which are geological layers that exist as caverns or porous rocks through which underground uh, groundwater may flow or be stored. Let's just have a look at the hydrological cycle, since we're talking about water, in which much of the world's fresh water supply is continuously recycled, purified and distributed via this process. It is a continuous cycle without a defined beginning or end. But if we were to imagine it as starting as if evaporated water from the surface of the ocean, then the water vapor would rise and begin to cool within the Earth's atmosphere, condense and form clouds. This moisture then, um, forming clouds, will then be distributed across the globe until it returns to the surface precipitation. We know this process, it's, uh, you know, we've learned this since we were children, but um, once the rain falls and um, makes contact with the Earth's surface once more, it may then either evaporate back into this uh, atmosphere, or some of it may penetrate into the ground and seep down to become groundwater, or it can travel along the surface and drain within lakes. So you can see those three things, either evaporate, sink down, or flow across into a river. Okay, At the end of the day, it will all return back to its source as a river, as the ocean, where it will then evaporate again to continue its cycle. Okay. Only a third of surface water runoff globally is actually available for consumption. So in terms of global rainfall annually, only a third of that um, actually is available for us to drink. So here we've got a picture of the hydrological cycle. Um, so you can see there they've got the lake, they've got the water um, rising, um, from the um, surface evaporating, forming your clouds, in which it, it rains in different areas. And then from there, you can see that we've got this, um, these different processes take place, taking place, in which some of it is evaporated, and uh, some of it flows down. And then we also have some of it going down into the ground to become aquifers. Okay, we don't have to worry about this unconfined and confined. Okay, but just as long as you know that you've got uh, these different types of layers of your aquifers in terms of your deep and your shallow, and then um, we then access those ground resources through use of um, boreholes and pumps, in which we then pump that water out. Okay, but that's that's for further. Okay. So a system under strain in which this hydrological process that has been continuing on for millennia is under, under strain at, due to um, anthropogenic processes. So under strain in the sense that it is not functioning as it should be in which processes such as urban, urbanization, agriculture and manufacturing processes are serving to undermine the effectiveness of this in which atmospheric change is fast altering um, the functioning of this process and is threatening ecological functions at large within given geographic regions. As such, intense uh, temperatures will evaporate more water, causing extreme weather conditions in climatic regions. Other examples are such as um, cities in which there are now impermeable surfaces. So now you have increased amounts of uh, runoff taking place. So, so cities are thus then uh, becoming areas of extreme flooding since the water cannot absorb into the ground and is just washing straight. And due to the excessive amounts that are taking place, sometimes stormwater uh, management is not enough. Um, so yes. Okay, so now that we've uh, looked at the basics of water, let's have a look at water in South Africa. 
So rainfall in South Africa is um, quite low compared to international um, averages in which we receive about 500 millimeters of rainfall annually uh, as compared to 860 millimeters annually uh, as the global average. So uh, in South Africa, some of our driest regions, uh, particularly in the West, receive less than 200 millimeters in which some areas in uh, the Northern Cape can receive only two millimeters in a whole year. Our country's wetter regions can receive up to 2,500 millimeters per year. So you can see that rainfall clearly is not evenly distributed, in which there is a narrow belt along the eastern and southern coast, which gets most of the rainfall, and the rest of the country only receives less than a third of the rest of our annual rainfall, 27%. So water is thus a very scarce resource in this country. Um, and in which we as South Africans frequently experience hydrological droughts, which can last up to 10 years, particularly for Gauteng, the last one lasted for about five to seven years, whereas Cape Town has probably only just recovered from its current drought. Okay, and then this is just to show you where the, uh, our driest regions are. You can clearly see there in the, the Northern Cape, um, and Western Cape areas towards our tip um, where Namibia is, very little rain is experienced there and then most of our rain comes from these regions over here and over there which coincide with our um, water catchment areas being the Drakensberg area. So um, let's have a look further then. Yeah, and here we have a um, slide just to show you the seasonal rainfall in each region uh, in which you can see once again most of the rain will often take place um, within this um, this portion over here um, you can see there even in winter it gets a little bit of rainfall as well as in spring and also still in autumn so yeah If we have a look at uh, rivers, there are very few natural lakes in South Africa and so we are incredibly dependent on our rivers, dams and underground water to meet our water needs. The country shares uh, four major rivers with six neighbouring states, which are Zimbabwe, Botswana, Mozambique and Swaziland, and also Namibia, and uh, these then warrant uh, various international water use agreements. Approximately 75% of South Africa's fresh flowing water occurs within southern and eastern borders, seaboards, where there are many short rivers. As you saw in that area I highlighted, the country's largest river, the Orange River, flows east to west and drains most of the remaining portions of the country into the sea. It starts in the Lesotho as the Sinqui and where the surrounding watersheds and drainage basins, which are the Drakensberg and the Maluti Mountains, provide water for it, where then the Orange River flows all the way west into the Atlantic Ocean, in which it borders the Namibian and South African territory. To further look at rivers, you can see that most of our rivers are not in a healthy state, in which of the 223 river ecosystems in the country, 60% are threatened, and a further 25% of that is uh, critically endangered, with 15% only being protected. And then if we have a look at our wetlands, 792 of them in total, 65% are threatened, in which 48%. If we look at our dams, uh, roughly half of the country's surface runoff from rainfall is stored within one of our 4,395 registered dams, in which 350 of that belongs to the department. Dams have both a negative and a positive ecological impact, in which they can regulate the flow of a river in which they can reduce flood damage. They can also offer perennial stream flow instead, instead of only seasonal since they control the water flow of an area. And they can also um, remove excess uh, nutrients within the water due to um, sediment deposition occurring within the, the dam. 
Uh, and so in some instances, thus water leaving a dam might be cleaner than when it first enters. However, negative uh, impacts would be that they reduce the river flow strength, which can cause sedimentation in estuaries. Sedimentation is when um, uh, cl uh, clay particles and uh, uh, you know sediment particles within um, a river are then slowed, and so because they are then slowed, they then fall. Uh, they sink down and then they gradually create an ever-growing layer of sediment um, and thus can cause to clog up in an estuary or um, a, a, a river body <coughs> due to slower moving water as a result of a dam being built. Furthermore, um, a dam acts as an artificial barrier which then interrupts linear ecosystems, which then prevent the free movement of biota within these habitats. So, for instance, fish can't move to their migrant, you know, their, their spawning grounds because there is now suddenly a wall that has been built. So, uh, what was once a flowing river is now an artificial and stagnant body of water, which creates deep deoxygenated zero light sterile zones which you can see particularly in hot beer sports South Africa is actually not suited for dam building since most of our mountain areas are incredibly old and so therefore quite low and so there are very few deep valleys and gorges in which we can build our dams so many of our dams are actually quite large and shallow and so therefore are vulnerable to evaporation such as the Vol Dam for instance even the Kharip the major the majority of our dams in the country country are, su are situated in hot and dry areas which we'll see uh, in a little bit just now and so therefore they, they evaporate quite quickly uh, with water evaporating from dams water quality thus decreases because as the concentration of water decreases there is then, thus then an increasing concentration of, of sediments and so the water becomes uh, as well as salts within that water and so even though a dam might only be at 20 or 30 percent capacity and there's still water in there that water might not be uh, drinkable that's why earlier i was saying that water is not about quantity but it's about quality and so therefore um, as our dams evaporate it reduces our availability of usable fresh water, not because of the physical decrease in water, but because of the, the decrease in the quality of that water. To have a look at our dams, you can see that um, the majority of our dams are within the, the agricultural space. Let me just quickly highlight that for you on the slide. So you can see there, most of them are, are um, agricultural, but um, you can see that a lot of them, uh, a lot of your agricultural dams are quite small. And uh, if we were to have a look at our department dams, which is the DWS, you can see that in total, they only have 323. But of that 323, they make up 88% of our national capacity. So in essence, governments, the DWS, owns most of the water, almost 90% of the water in our country. And so therefore they are custodians of our water resources in our country. And uh, just to highlight there, agriculture is the major, is the largest other single user and, um, and uh, provider of water uh, in which they store their own water uh, as compared to mines and other other industries. So if we have a look at our wetlands, um, wetlands are probably one of the most important ecosystems in our country since we don't have a lot of water in the first place. So they are very difficult to define due to the uh, vast variety in size, their location, as well as uh, dependent on soil saturation. But the most defining features of a wetland are the uh, waterlogged soils or soils covered with a shallow layer of water, whether seasonally or permanently. There are un uh, and they are also classified according to the unique types of soils and sediments. Some examples 
examples of marshes are marshes, bogs, swamps, and flays. And here we just have a, a map here just to show you the extent of the wetlands in our country, but more importantly to also just highlight how they have been affected by anthropogenic forces in terms of our development and in terms of um, how we have removed a lot of these wetlands uh, for uh, agricultural, manufacturing, or even just um, uh, residential spaces. You can see that quite a few of them highlighted in brown have been heavily to critically modified, that is to say either drained or completely removed where they no longer serve the ecological function. Wetlands play an essential part in the ecological process in which they act to control flooding, they clean water and they also uh, serve to protect the habitat for wildlife. So in terms of controlling flooding, wetland areas along streams and rivers slow water flow and prevent inundation. This is since they uh, slow fast moving water by spreading it out over a greater area and allows for greater penetration of water. In this, they then act as a sponge, which then reduces the possible damage due to erosion and creates a more steady flow of water throughout the year. Since they act as a sponge and they slow the water, there is lots of vegetation that um, grows. And so the water quality can then be improved in a stream through which a wetland is. Since soil and vegetation will then filter and take up um, any toxins and uh, nutrients within that water and then uh, can also take up um, harmful bacteria which is present in the water and in many cases therefore water is far cleaner when exiting a wetland than when it first entered. There was once a case in which uh, there was actually a municipal water station that was pumping effluent sewage, raw sewage into a wetland and uh, this wetland extended for about two kilometers and you could find that the E. coli levels before and after entering the, uh, the wetland were far different in terms of uh, how much uh, the water was cleaned because of a wetland. So they, they, they really are useful filtration uh, mechanisms in our environment. They also serve to protect the habitat um, of our wildlife in which um, there is an accumulation of sediments and nutrients that occur within there. And so because of that, there is then a vast abundance of flora that can um, thrive within a wetland. And so because you have all these, uh, uh, you know, these reeds, bushes and aquatic plants, it attracts a vast variety of birds, amphibians and fish species, as well as mammals. Excuse me. Uh, and so this makes wetlands a prime ecological uh, of prime ecological importance in terms of pre uh, preserving the integrity of ecosystems and ensuring their bio uh, biodiversity. To have a look at groundwater. So in terms of groundwater, it's a bit of a complex topic since there are so many variables involved, such as the geographic region, the geological composition, as well as other topographic factors such as rainfall and soil transmissivity. Fundamental to the understanding of groundwater hydrology is the concept of interstices. Uh, these are the open spaces which act as a, as a conduit for groundwater through which water bearing rocks uh, may either serve to, to store water or may act to, to facilitate flow from one region to another. The, um, the transmissivity of these rocks, as well as the abundance of groundwater openings within a locality, can determine the availability of groundwater in the region. On top of that, it uh, affects the recharge of a groundwater resource, uh, and that in itself is dependent on annual rainfall, uh, the availability of nearby surface water, as well as what the subsurface moisture retention is, and other factors such as the vegetation cover. And um, groundwater supplies about 15% of the country's water needs. And while this is true, almost 66% of the country, including 280 towns within the country's drier parts, are largely dependent 
on this resource. So um, it is very important since uh, it's quite easily available since you just need to drill a hole down and then pump it out. And it's cost effective and is more reliable than surface water due to the lower rates of evaporation. So with groundwater, you, you require monitoring thereof. And since climate change is becoming an issue that is more prominent and um, population is then also adding to this problem in terms of adding pressure to, to our water resources, there is then need for monitoring and regulation of groundwater resources, uh, which is becoming ever more important. So as of 2018 and 2019, there has been uh, a steady decline in groundwater levels on a national scale, which is due to many reasons, such as the prolonged hydrological um, drought, which has reduced recharge of most of the groundwater regions, as well as anthropogenic extraction, which has begun to increase um, uh, to, to over abstraction in some regions uh, as a result of the drought due to farmers needing to drill boreholes to keep up their livelihoods as uh, their dams begin to dry up and this is especially true within the Limpopo and Western Cape provinces. It is estimated that 78% of groundwater use is for commercial and subsistence um, agricultural use in which 7% is used for rural domestic use and only 4% is used by the urban resident. This is significant since agricultural industry is responsible for most of the groundwater contamination through diffusion of herbicides and pesticides as well as fertilizers into the local aquifers or interstices. Overpumping of water of groundwater can lead to shortages in food production increases in food prices as well as increased disparities between those who have and those who do not. As water tables begin to drop, there is then a need for the use of more powerful pumps uh, in order to reach deeper levels. So water tables in this instance do not drop in a single locality but over a much larger area. This then means that for instance a commercial farmer might be able to afford the added cost increases in terms of deepening their well and um, paying for increased electricity costs, but his or her neighbour would not, who relies on subsistence farming and perhaps makes use of a hand pump would not be able to do the same. As the water table further drops and aquifers and associated instances become void of water, there is then the occurrence of land subsidence. This is a, as a result of water no longer being present to maintain the integrity of the soft porous rock. So the soil above becomes heavy and then sinks. In extreme cases, sinkholes will appear. In terms of lab subsidence, we often get the appearance of sinkholes, which are actually quite a co common occurrences within South Africa. Uh, such as, for example, in the far west rand, as you can see on the picture to the right, that is in uh, just 13 kilometers south of Ranfontein, where there are lots of mines, and uh, they are just as prolific in the Gauteng North, uh, in, in the Pretoria Centurion area, as you can see in this residential area. As the water table drops, um, the soil above it collapses down with it. As you can see, particularly in this right picture here, we can actually see the soil around it um, collapsing down. And you can actually see most of the area kind of exists as an area of dead soil as the, the land around it subsides down. So it's really quite interesting and quite terrible to be honest. Subsidence in South Africa is mostly a phenomenon that occurs within the karst landscapes in the northwest province as well as in the western and northern regions of Gauteng. This mostly occurs as a result of dewatering activities that take place due to mining. Mining activities will always come into contact with underground water. Either the mineral resource is underneath or is within 
regions uh, of a water table in or, uh, within a region's water table. In order to access the minerals, the groundwater is then dewatered, which is a process in which groundwater is pumped somewhere else. This then creates a void within the substrata and causes instability, in which large tracts of land will then collapse, as seen in the previous figure. In the free state gold fields, for instance, uh, in the free state gold fields, for instance, there are two major aquifers in the area, one shallow at about 30 to 40 meters below, and then a deeper one at about 1,500 to 1,800 meters below. This shallow aquifer provides low yields of high quality water, and the opposite is true for the deep aquifer, in which it has high yields of poor water quality. Much of the gold present in this uh, much of the gold is present within this deeper aquifer, and so is often then pumped out. Its low quality thus provides justification for its dewatering, but there is still very little which we understand about the underground water networks in terms of flows and recharge mechanisms. This water is often pumped out into slimes dams for evaporation, and uh, this has been going on for about 40 years in which 3.7 million tons of salts have come up to the surface in the form of evaporated subsurface water. Other water supply methods in South Africa. Desalination involves the removal of dissolved salts from oceanic or brackish water that can be found within aquifers or lakes. There are two methods to this process. The one is distillation, which involves heating the salt water, which then evaporates, leaving behind salt and condenses its fresh water. There is also then osmosis and or microfiltration, in which salt water is forced through a membrane at a high pressure. And uh, this membrane has pores that are so small that fresh water can pass through, but will prevent salt and other impurities from getting onto, into the other side. Currently, desalination provides only 1% of the global supply of fresh water, and um, this is because it is an incredibly costly process and requires vast amounts of energy. In addition, um, oceanic water requires chemical sterilization in order to remove algae and microorganisms, which then further adds to the costs. Um, desalination produces vast quantities of brine, which is highly salty uh, water, and that needs to be gotten rid of. But um, this cannot be done without completely altering the immediate um, environment. So you can't just pump it into an estuary or into um, a coastal area because you, you, you'll change that, the microenvironment there by changing the salt concentration present. You can't um, do this on land either because you might stand the risk of contaminating your groundwater resources in which that highly salty water might sink down into the water, uh, the groundwater resources and then would be taken up by a farmer who would then water his crops only to have them die from thirst of all things. Desalination is thus only currently used in extreme water short cities or in countries as an emergency response as seen in Cape Town. To have a look at interbasin transfers, this is a scheme which facilitates the movement of water from an area which has a healthy water supply and a low demand to an area in which there is a high demand and a low availability of water. Southern Africa is comprised of 15 sovereign states in which 11 are on the continental homeland. These countries share 15 river basins among them. Given that most of these countries are water stressed, there is then hydropolitical situation that surrounds the use of water amongst static countries. Most notable river basins are the Zambezi, Limpopo and Orange rivers, which feed numerous countries along the international boundaries. There are seven major intercashment um, transfer schemes in operation in South Africa, with an additional eight either under construction or still within the proposal stage. The largest of which, and will be discussed, is the Orange Fish River Scheme. 
So water gravitates from the Orange River into the Gharib Dam, where it is then piped through tunnels and canals to the Sundays and Fish Rivers in the Eastern Cape. Other basin transfer schemes that are part of this are the Tugela Val, the Lusutu and the Lusutu Highlands Val project. There are proposals in the works between other neighbouring countries in terms of developing water purchase agreements in order to continue our future development and these might exist um, between Botswana uh, for the Okavango River Basin as well as with Zimbabwe in terms of um, the Zambezi River. So just to have a look at the Orange Fish River scheme, uh, you can see um, it is actually quite a large area um, extending not just in South Africa, but also in Botswana and Namibia, as well as originating, most importantly, in the city. So um, just to have a look here, um, these values over here uh, indicate how much uh, water that they can uh, produce in terms of annual runoff in millions of um, cubic meters. So you can see that most of our water then originates from this Lesotho Highlands area, where it then decants um, from its southern border all the way up into the center of our country, uh, where it then uh, enters into the Vol confluence. Okay, um, and then from there goes further all the way to our coast uh, where it flows west. So you can see that it actually flows north at a point here. And um, so let's just have a look and continue. So just to focus on the other, on the western portion where it goes through all those dry regions there, um, you can see especially here where the vol and the orange meet, um, it then flows into this Buchu Dam where it then um, travels via a series of canals and pipelines into our various rural regions. And then it continues to flow and then even um, Pof Adder, as well as Springbok and um, Kleinsia, they receive water um, through the system of pipelines. And this is all the way from the Sutu that they get their water. Uh, the same is true in terms of this slide here, where you can actually see we've got a pipeline of underground tunnels that go from um, this grass ridge dam all the way into the, the from the Kharib dam all the way into this grass ridge dam um, to, uh, to feed major cities such as um, Port Elizabeth as well as Grahamstown. And these guys wouldn't receive water if it wasn't for the, uh, this um, basement transfer um, scheme, in which you can see it comes from um, a whole other country, two other provinces, and actually not even connected via a river system, but rather through underground uh, pipelines, as well as um, man-made canals. So just in terms of appreciating the, the general extent of our um, engineering. Uh, I mean, if you were to look at this, for instance, this is a 45 kilometer long pipeline, uh, which is about 4.3 meters in diameter. And that flows all the way from the um, this uh, dam over here in Lesotho, all the way into the Vol Dam. And that's then how we get our water into Gauteng, into Johannesburg, as well as Pretoria. We would not be able to have a city if it weren't for, uh, for, for such um, a project. Um, so South Africa is uh, one of the most economically developed of the static countries, and therefore its um, water infrastructural system uh, is, is has to be on par with that in order to sustain its economical development. Um, and 100% of Gauteng's gross geographic product is responsible, uh, is, is sustained 
from this interbasin water transfer uh, from the Lesotho Highlands project. And um, this is still an ongoing project in which it is still in, in phase three, in which phase one uh, included the construction of hydroelectricity. And this is what powers uh, Lesotho. Okay, using water system. So fresh water use in South Africa, um, the largest consumer of fresh water in this country are, uh, go, are our farmers. Um, it, it goes straight towards food production in terms of irrigation and cropland production. And then the next major water user is the urban resident. Um, so in 2005, 95% of the country's water resources had already been fully allocated. Um, and so much of this water is beginning to decline in quality and therefore in quantity. And it is estimated that South Africa will not have enough water to supply the population with its needs by the year 2030. And that is why that there are these purchase agreements being made with our neighbors countries. In 2012, the Department of Water and Sanitation estimated that water lost through leaks cost the country about 7.2 billion rand with a 37% loss. In some rural municipalities, this loss was as high as 80%. Globally, this um, accounts for about 66%. So in, in, in terms of nationally, we're doing okay, but we could definitely do better in terms of how much water we, how much we rely on water and how little we actually have, especially since South African dams can lose up to three times the amount of water they receive from rainfall due to evaporation. And as you saw from those water transfer schemes, most of it occurs, uh, the, the Orange River Basin flows west in our dry regions, and that's where we've built up a lot of our canals and, and um, dam systems. And that's why there's so much water that evaporates in our system. And um, so in agriculture, most of the water in is lost through irrigation, in which only 60% of water used for irrigation actually reaches crops. Okay, but now this is in general, not, not specific to South Africa, because um, water loss related to irrigation is dependent on the type of irrigation method that you use, in which one of your least efficient types of irrigation is flood irrigation, in which um, groundwater is pumped to the surface into lined ditches, which then irrigate the soil, up to 45% of your water can then be lost through evaporation. And um, another inefficient system is your traditional spray irrigation, in which large volumes are sprayed onto crops, and this can lose up to 40% of your water used. So your types of irrigation, um, there's just a picture. Uh, in, t in terms of more efficient irrigation, the, um, we, uh, we have your center pivots, which are becoming quite popular at the moment. I'm sure you must have seen those circular fields out um, in your rural areas, and they have um, a center pivot that then rotates. And uh, this makes use of low pressure sprinklers and 80% um, of your water then can be taken up to crops. And this can be improved up to 95% in which you're only losing 5% of your water used. And then uh, drip or trickle irrigation methods is probably the most efficient method in which that relies on um, using a small amounts of water which are delivered directly to where your crop roots are and that makes use of a network of perforated tubes that are placed directly to where your crops grow but only five percent of the world's population actually makes use of this highly effective method so if we have a look at addressing water from a demand demand side so we've discussed the supply side in which for many years we have often focused on resolving our water problems through supply side development. That is to say that we built dams, we, we moved water uh, from water rich regions to water poor regions, uh, we developed um, desalination plants, or you know we, we addressed supply by drilling hot, more holes into the ground in order to abstract groundwater. Um, in Cape Town, for instance, officials uh, work to reduce water waste down to 15%, which 
which is almost half, more than half the, the country's average. And uh, so, so this then uh, reduced the need to supplement their water uh, supply uh, by, you know, so, so they, 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 would prov they could avoid then um, drilling more holes or having to build a dam by reducing their intake. And um, this is important because 90% of water used by major industrial industries, such as in manufacturing, uh, the pulp and paper uh, production is lost through waste water. So if we were to enforce that uh, water be reticulated or recycled, this would markedly alleviate the pressures on the country's water system. Other opportunities exist in demand side approaches, uh, exist in grey water recycling, such as um, your sink water could be used to flush your toilet, or perhaps you could catch a shower water within a bucket and also um, you could probably reduce the number of times you flush a toilet. Um, so these are just a few examples. Um, there is also then the economic approach to the demand side. And this is something that we use in South Africa uh, because one of the major causes of water waste is its low cost. As mentioned earlier, many people in industries disregard the value of water because it appears to hold little value to them. It's, it's cheap and so, so people don't think much of it. Uh, if water were more expensive, it would be used more sparingly. So in South Africa, we make use of what's called a block system, uh, in which this follows an incremental system in which a proportion of the national water fiscus is allocated to every citizen for free. So everyone has a right to 25 litres per day or 6,000 litres per month per household. Okay, but then if you use more than that block, the price of water will then increase. So, for instance, if you um, uh, if you need water for for basic necessities, for drinking, for sanitation, you have it to you freely available. But if you want to use it more than that, such as for filling up a swimming pool or for um, watering your garden every day, you will then incur a greater cost to that. Um, and then obviously that will change depending on water restrictions, depending on the drought, so on and so forth. And um, that is it from me. Um, that is uh, your lecture on uh, water. We will then be doing water pollution. Um, I will have up on uh, Blackboard um, some various textbook references in which uh, there is living in the environment. Uh, we will be on the chapter on water, which is chapter 13. Uh, and then it will also be in the environmental management in South Africa by Stradelman King. I will have um, some scans over there. Um, it's not a complete chapter. It's just various portions of a chapter. And I will have that in there. If I remember correctly, it will be fresh water and river systems. Um, but please have a look at that. That is uh, what I've mostly been using as a reference to make these slides. So if you read through that, you will definitely be prepared for any further assessments. Uh, in terms of assessments, I'm not too sure how it's going to be done but um, uh, you will re be required to do um, ongoing assessments, which we'll discuss on Friday. So thanks very much again. I hope you have a lovely day and um, do keep safe.